is taking so long? What? Why, why is what takes so long? What are you talking about? Your Borderlands 3 video. Where the fuck is it? Dude, calm down, all right? I'm working on it. Relax. Working on it? Working on it? The game came out months ago, you lazy sack of shit! No, it didn't. It just came out. Hey, Freeze, it's Keen. Just here to remind you, uh, just to do your video. It's December. It's, um, it's getting pretty late. I don't know what's the problem. Are you having some computer issues? Did your, uh, did your system freeze? Huh? Yeah. Did your system freeze? <laughs> Oh shit. I've always been a pretty huge Borderlands fan. Borderlands 1 and 2 were some of my favorite games to play with my brothers when I was growing up. Hell, I still consider 2 to be one of the best co-op games ever released. So you can imagine my excitement when I saw... <sighs> when I saw this shit get announced. After playing Borderlands 3 pretty... <laughs> pretty goddamn extensively. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that I love this game. I also hate it. But I love it. But, but I also fucking hate it. Let me explain what I mean. I guess we should start off with what this game does right and god... God damn does it really do this shit right. Dude, check out the sweet gun I just pulled off a corpse. Oh shit, it's fucking cool, dude. Know, right? Dude, check out this fucking legendary I got off that boss early. It's fucking rad. Here we go. The gameplay in this game is easily the best in any Borderlands game ever. Hell, it's probably the most fun gameplay out of any looter shooter I've ever played. Just, just fucking look at this shit. <sighs> Alright, so as per usual, this game gives you four different characters to choose from, each with their own unique abilities and skill trees. You got Amara the Siren, Zane the Operator, Moe's the Gunner, and Flack the Beastmaster. Amara can do your standard issue siren space magic bullshit, you know, slamming the ground with her shulkan arms, uh, locking enemies in place, and just generally being mommy material. Holy fuck, please, step on my neck! Zane's kind of an interesting one, with an ability to throw out a handy little sentinel, create a digicline that you can swap places with at will, and a neat little shield to keep your pals from getting yeeted. To be honest, I, when, when I I tried to play him, I tried to unleash my uh, inner Reinhardt by focusing super hard on the, the shield, but the people I played with just like, not used it, so... <laughs> Mose is basically D.Va from Overwatch with uh, customization options. <sighs> yeah. And Fleck. Ugh! My main man! This dude is easily my favorite character. Fleck gets to choose one of three different pets to have out at all times to help with combat, and as he levels up, he can even unlock new variants of each one. On top of this, Fleck's abilities allow him to send out racks to damage enemies, cloak himself for a short period of time while dealing critical damage, and he can teleport his pet to a specific spot and deal damage to all enemies in that area. Pretty much all footage you see in this video from here on out will be of Fleck gameplay because he is the best boy! The best boy! self-awareness and I thirst for murder. Okay, so setting my obvious thirst for Robot Daddy aside, there's clearly more to this game than just its characters. So let's talk about the biggest thing Borderlands always jerks itself off over, the guns. I really enjoy the level of variety in this game when it comes to its guns. The game gives you so many different options to tackle enemies with. Even setting aside the obvious broader variations like SMGs versus snipers, the different gun brands themselves feel even more distinct from one another than they did in the previous games because of how differently they operate from one another. As just one easy example, a Malawan shotgun is going to give you a wildly different Different experience than a Jacobs. Malawan shotguns have a wind-up before they fire and will typically fire either a singular blast of damage or rapidly fire multiple rounds in a very quick succession. In either case, while the base damage probably isn't that noteworthy, Malawan always deals some sort of elemental damage and can be great for taking out strong enemies over a more stretched out period of time. Malawan weapons can also generally swap between two different elements, making them a solid choice if you want to be prepared for multiple types of enemies. A Jacobs, on the other hand, will just fire instantly and doesn't have any elemental damage at all. However, their base damage is typically far higher compared to other brands 
brand, so they're usually pretty great for wiping out weaker enemies very quickly. And on top of just the sheer amount of variety, a lot of these guns also have secondary fire modes, not just Malawan. This honestly adds a whole new layer of fun to the combat. You haven't lived until you've had a sniper rifle that doubles as a fucking rocket launcher. Even just the raw feedback this game gives you is fantastic. As much as I loved Borderlands 2, most of its guns always felt really floaty, but in this game, everything feels like it has some actual weight behind it. Like this shit actually packs a punch. Especially if you're a controller using Cuckboy like me, where the sound design of the guns are complemented by the vibrations of the controller. And I haven't even mentioned the environments. Oh my god, this shit is so good! Again, while I absolutely love the previous Borderlands game, the environments by and large all felt very samey. They were primarily just a bunch of desert with maybe an occasional city or an ancient temple thrown in. Except the pre-sequel. That one was mostly just moons, so. So instead of looking at a bunch of sand and rocks all day, you just look at moon rocks all day. Yay! But in 3, there's actually a good amount of variety in where you do your shooty shooty bang bangs. The game takes you to several different planets, and each one is genuinely fun to run around in and explore. Even the enemies in those areas feel unique. Oh god, these fucking enemies! Each planet has its own unique set of enemies that try to kill you in their own way. You've got your standard bandits, uh, you've got your killer monkeys, uh, you've got these fucking assholes. All around, the enemies are just a fucking blast to kill, including the bosses. Uh, most of them anyway, we'll get... We'll get more into that later. But the vast majority of these bosses are an absolute joy to fight. They don't do what a lot of the previous Borderlands bosses did and just act like big bullet sponges. Looking at you, Destroyer from Borderlands 1, you anti-looking motherfucking piece of shit. They're actually engaging and force you to pay attention to your surroundings. They tend to have pretty varied sets of attacks to use against you, and they do such a good job of making it feel like an actual fight instead of you just standing in one spot, sinking as many bullets into them as you can. <coughs> Basically, what I'm saying is I want the rampage to rampage all over my boy put. Between the guns, the enemies, the bosses, the ridiculous amount of customization you can do with your characters. Holy fuck, you can even put dumb little trinkets on your guns. Look at that cute ass shit. This game is just a ton of fun. Easily the most fun Borderlands game Gearbox has ever put out, and I don't say that lightly. But as I mentioned, this game has some problems, particularly when it comes to the story. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that that shit. What's up guys? God Queen Tyrene coming at you live. Oh, I am so Ready for Borderlands. Oh man. Hansel Jack who? Never heard of him. I'm the new funny antagonist around here. Let's go. Hey, would you uh like like some help there? Okay, so here are just a few of the complaints I have about this game's story. Maybe I should slow down a bit. Okay, so the story is absolute dog shit. There really isn't any beating around the bush here. The drop in quality of the storytelling between 2 and 3, hell, between pre-sequel and 3 is fucking astounding. Let's start with the most obvious problem here. The game's main antagonists, the Calypso Twins. Fuck you. Fuck you too. And fuck you again just for good measure. These two are some of the most cringy ass villains I have dealt with in a game in a long fucking time. They're unfunny, one dimensional, borderline knockoffs of handsome Jacks. Just swap out Jack's hero complex for a god complex and make him incredibly unfunny. Boom, you got the Calypso twins. <coughs> oh, I swear to fuck, I genuinely hate these two. Every time they spoke, I wanted to light myself on fire. They're so painful to listen to. They try so hard to be funny, but their jokes just don't work. And look, I totally get it. Comedy is subjective. This could totally just be me but good fucking god. Listen to this and tell me whether or not you actually got a laugh out of it. I'm serious. Post in the comments. Does this shit make you laugh? Because, oh fuck. Private transit pods. Fart up your commute in peace. Apollyon Station. Just blast that subway car with your butt stinky. Stop. Stop it. Die. Now don't get me wrong, there are actually some pretty solid lines of dialogue from these two. But they're so few and far between, most of what they say is either boring exposition, mediocre taunts, or just unfunny bullshit. Even the backstory we learn about them fucking sucks. Your dad told you stories about when he was a vault hunter and kept you trapped on a planet so you'd start to fucking wipe out the universe? Excuse me? What? What the fuck led you to make that fucking mental leap? You know, I don't want to make too many comparisons to Borderlands 2. I really don't. But as I sit here and analyze these two as villains, I can't help but think about something that one of the writers for Borderlands 2 wrote back in 2013 when he was describing the process of writing Handsome Jack as a character. In the first draft of the script, Jack was a non-stop joke apocalypse. All. The. Time. You started up the game, he'd crack a joke. You fight his girlfriend, he'd crack a joke. You murder his daughter, 
He'd crack a joke. After we recorded the first draft of the script, I got feedback from Paul, Jeremy, and Mikey that Jack felt one-dimensional. He was kind of funny, sure, but he was basically the same one-note joke played over and over for 40 hours. I'm Jack. I'm arrogant. I'm going to kill you. You're pathetic. I'm ludicrously indifferent to the suffering of others. It was tiresome and repetitive to say the least. To fix this, we treated Angel's death as Jack's breaking point. Before his daughter dies, everything is hilarious to Jack. After Angel dies, however, we try to make a clear break. He stops making jokes and starts getting angry for the first time in the entire game. By removing some of Jack's jocularity in the third act, we attempted to give him an arc. He starts off thinking the player is irrelevant, then finds them amusing, then hates them with an unquenchable passion to the point where he will do anything to kill the player in single combat. This is incidentally the same exact arc we wanted the player to experience in regards to Jack. This right here, at least in my opinion, pretty well describes why the Calypsos never feel particularly interesting as villains. They don't have a notable arc. There's never a switch where their characters change. They start and end as what Jack was in that first draft of Borderlands 2. Non-stop joke machines that view themselves as superior and the Vault Hunters as inferior. To be fair, there are a few small spots where you can see them get frustrated or angry, but even those rare moments are immediately followed up by them going right back to their haha, we're gods and we're gonna make fun of you shtick. But to be honest, none of this is what really pisses me off about them. I can deal with boring villains. I can. I still love Devil May Cry 1 even though Mundus is boring as fuck. What pisses me off is that these two actually had a lot of potential that the writers just completely wasted. Holy shit, there's so much here that could have led to something incredible. Instead of poorly done handsome Jack ripoffs, they easily could have come across as their own unique and interesting characters. And that's because as concepts, they're actually super fucking interesting. Tyrene is a siren whose power is absorbing the life energy from others and Troy is essentially a human parasite that has to absorb energy from her to survive. That sets up what could have been a really cool dynamic between the two, but the writers never really do anything with it. Let's analyze this shit a bit closer, shall we? Alright, so right from the get-go, this game shows hints of animosity between Troy and Tyrene. These two very clearly have a very complicated relationship. I'm the siren. He's just a parasite. Literally. When we were born, our father had to cut him off me. Now I'm the only thing keeping him alive. It very much seems like Tyrene only puts up with Troy because he's her brother, and Troy only seems to put up with Tyrene because he needs her to survive. Or at least that's what he believes at first. You see, a good while into the game, Game, Troy and Tyrene make a pretty damn interesting discovery. Troy can actually absorb energy from any siren. This. This right here could have been, and should have been, their character switch. This could have been to the Calypsos what Angel's death was to Jack, the moment they evolve as characters, and it just didn't happen. These two clearly don't like each other, and after killing Maya... <sighs> More on that bullshit later. Troy now knows that he doesn't actually need Tyrene. And as the game goes on, Troy starts becoming more assertive, something Tyrene is clearly not happy with. Uh, hey sis, the vault thief's trying to rescue that gunsmith you snatched. Do your thing, the, the teleporty thing. Yeah, sure, but because I want to, not because you asked. Whatever, just do it already, asshole. Well, vault thief's still alive. Guess I should have anointed a few more of the family. That's the real power. Reminds me why I kept you alive all these years. Oh, come on. Don't be like that. We're having fun. <laughs> right? And she walked away. This is such an obvious fucking setup, holy shit! But other than occasionally throwing out some verbal jabs at each other, they stay completely on course. Their dynamic stays basically the same. Okay, so indulge me for just a second here as I go full YouTube gamer and basically write some dumbass fanfiction to describe what they could have done here that would have been infinitely more interesting than what they actually did. What if, after Troy gains Maya's powers, they really leaned in on Troy wanting to assert himself more over Tyrene? He starts taking more initiative, making decisions without really discussing it with her, and maybe even doing some live streams on his own. Now, obviously, this wouldn't sit well with Tyrene. As we know, she isn't exactly big on sharing the spotlight. So, maybe she starts getting angry, starts viewing him as a threat. And as she gets angrier and the tension between the two develops, maybe Troy realizes, hey, why do I even need her anymore? Why can't I just kill her, take her powers, and run the cult myself? After all, if I took her powers, I wouldn't really need a siren to absorb from anymore, would I? I could just absorb from anyone else like she does. And then it happens. Troy backstabs Tyrene. Maybe after fighting against both of them, we see Troy betray her and take her powers, becoming a much stronger antagonist than the single leader of the COV. Or maybe he doesn't kill her. Maybe at some point he tries, but fails, and essentially a civil war starts out between two factions, those that follow Troy and those that remain loyal to Tyrene. 
Tyrene. Maybe Tyrene could even start a very tentative alliance with the Crimson Raiders to take down her brother. Who fucking knows? They could have done anything along those lines and those characters would have been more fun to watch. But no, they didn't do anything. No character arc, no payoff to their sibling rivalry, nothing. The closest we get to any of this is Troy absorbing some of his sister powers to charge the Vault Key, and even that's clearly just to keep their original plan going. There doesn't seem to be any intention on Troy's part to cause her harm. Their motivations are still exactly the same as when we met them, and their characters, at least in my opinion, suffer for it. Also, just as a side note, and to circle back to what I was saying earlier about the bosses, Tyrene is the final boss fight in this game, and it's... It's pretty fucking boring, honestly. Like, no joke, when I beat her, I was surprised when I found out that, like, that was it. There's no second phase, nothing. She's just, just, just dead. She's done. That's it. The whole game trying to build up to, like, this big, epic, godlike boss and just... Okay, I guess she's dead now. But the Calypsos aren't the only problem with this game's story. In fact, they at least have some redeeming qualities. For example, even though Troy's wasted potential drives me up the fucking wall, I can at least appreciate some things about him, like his badass character design, as well as his boss fight. Oh my god, Troy might actually be my favorite boss fight in this game. Dude is fun as fuck. What I can't defend, however, is how they did so many other characters dirty. What the fuck were they thinking when they just threw Tina, Brick, and Mordecai to the wayside like that? These people are around for one or two main missions, and then the story just completely forgets about them. Them. Like, entirely. They don't exist. They just get shoved off to the side where all they can do is dole out side quests that don't have any impact on anything. That would be pretty damn forgivable if it was just Tina. Like, okay, sure, she was already just a side character to begin with, so I'm not really upset about her not getting much spotlight. But Brick? Mordecai? These two were major players in the first two games, and Lilith never even acknowledges their existence. Never! She never says anything to them. No hi, no how you doing, no hey lost friend, I've missed you, I sure am glad to have you guys helping the Crimson Raiders again. Nothing! No fucking joke, Lilith spends more time talking to Vaughn than she does the two people she's been friends with the longest. Vaughn! Fucking Vaughn? Also, just to circle back again, what the fuck was Maya's death? Oh my god, they handled that so fucking poorly. Roland's death in 2 worked so well because they made sure that shit had an actual impact. They spent the whole game up to that point giving the players chances to get to know him as a person, to enjoy his character, and then when Jack kills him, that shit reverberates throughout the rest of the game. The impact of that moment stretches onwards until the very end. Fuck, they even deal with it after the game. A good chunk of Tiny Tina's DLC in 2 revolves around her trying to deal with that that loss. We don't get that with Maya. After she dies, we get one scene where a few people mourn, like three people speak, and then it's almost never brought up again. And you know what? That still could have been fine. I could have been okay with her death getting glossed over if they at least made her protege Ava develop because of it. But she fucking doesn't. She goes through no change. She gets mad, lashes out for a bit, blames Lilith, and then is pretty much over it. Like, that's it. It's done. She doesn't talk about it anymore. Fuck. And for some reason, the game actually acts like she went through some kind of fucking arc. Lilith, for basically no fucking reason, just lets her tag along for the final assault, and then Lair's like, yeah, you know what, fuck it, Sanctuary's yours now. What? Why? Actually fucking why? Every plot point surrounding her is like a bad joke. Oh, and um, speaking of bad jokes... The Lord of Skags has logged back on! Where once I fragged for glory, now I hack for freedom. We shall bring Bandwidth back to Pandora. No longer shall we suffer stale ten-second old memes. Without memes, how will we know what's funny? Pandora will have only the freshest, choicest memes, like Two Smock Jeff. <laughs> Don't even get a second smock. <laughs> This game basically has the same meme style of humor that Borderlands 2 had, but most of the jokes just fall on their fucking face. Now to be fair, some of the jokes are actually pretty damn solid. Funny enough, most of the good shit actually comes from the game's side quests. But most of the time, the game just leans so fucking hard into the meme shit, it just fucking ruins everything. It's like the writers just kinda decided that referencing meme culture, being loud, or just being flippant is a total substitute for clever writing. Look, I don't want to spend so much time shitting on the game's writing, I really don't. But there's so much stupid 
stupid bullshit here and it adds up so fucking quickly. There are things I want to like about the story. An easy example is that there are several character introductions that I really like. Typhon de Leon is certainly a personal favorite of mine. The way he speaks and delivers his wisecracks works really well. Holy shit, fucking bless this man's voice actor. Finding Typhon's echo logs throughout the different areas genuinely feels worth it just to hear him speak. But the amount of entertaining characters in this game is vastly outweighed by the number of garbage ones. The amount of funny jokes are vastly outweighed by the unfunny ones. And the amount of interesting side quests... You know, you know what? The side quests are actually fairly 50-50. Hey, what's up? I'm any opinion about this game that isn't System Freezes. He's the quintessential gamer. Everything he says is objective. All of this is right. If you disagree, you're wrong. That's the joke, kids. Okay, bye. Love you. Like and subscribe. Drink water. Tell me for you. Okay, so this is kind of where I'm just gonna cram some final opinions I have on things that I didn't really get to earlier in the video. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to call this section, but eh, since I want Mr. Tord to explode all over my insides, I figure calling this section the explodey is eh, pretty appropriate. You are back out! As much time as I spent shitting on the game's main story, most of the side quests are actually really fun. Overall, I honestly think they're way better than the main quest line. Sure, sometimes you'll get... Sometimes you'll get this dumb shit, but other times you get genuinely good moments like this whole ass side quest where you're just going through a really shitty early access game. The jokes here are pretty fucking ham-fisted, but hey, you know what? They got a chuckle out of me, I can't lie. There's another one I really like where you're supposed to take some crotchety old bastard out to help with errands. Dude's a piece of shit, but it's okay because the game just straight up lets you kill him and be done with the quest. Like, <laughs> come on, that's... It's pretty goddamn Borderlandsy. Despite all the bullshit, there really is a lot of fun to be had with this game. Sure, the final boss is trash, like, genuinely unfun. But you know what? The end game shit after that? Fucking love it. After you beat the game, they provide you with three different levels of mayhem mode, which makes the enemies way harder, but cranks up the loot drop rate, making it a challenging but effective way to farm for loot. Haha, <laughs> prank. It turns out they've updated the game since I recorded that. Now, now there's four level mayhems. Mother. It's very rare for a game to be fun enough for me to want to go back and farm old bosses, but the added challenge of Mayhem Mode actually makes me excited to do just that. The amount of times I've refought the Rampager is just fucking stupid. I know I spent a lot of time shitting on the game's story. I did. And the funny thing? I didn't even talk about the majority of my complaints. There's a lot of stupid bullshit about the main questline that actively pisses me off. But you know what? There's a lot here that I love as well. Without spoiling anything, the B-plots on Planets Promethea and Eden 6 were genuinely really well done. Those plot points were unironically way more entertaining than the overall story that encompasses them. I would argue that they were probably the strongest moments of the entire game. But at the end of the day, a game's most important feature will always be its raw gameplay, and as I mentioned earlier, the gameplay in 3 is easily the best in the series. It's so good, in fact, that despite my many issues with the campaign, I honestly now consider 3 to be my favorite game in the franchise. And considering the fact that Borderlands 2, you know, exists? That's saying a lot. I love this game, and if you haven't already, I genuinely recommend picking it up. It is a ton of fun, especially if you play with friends. So, if there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this video, one final message that I want you guys to lock firmly into your beautiful wrinkled brains, I want it to be this. Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. Oh. What the fuck? Oh. I was in a menu, so that kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> oh my god! I'm still in the menu and I see like my character's out- What the fuck? <laughs> what the hell am I looking at? No bugs at all.